survivors of horrific atrocities must learn to live with what can never be forgotten. What can we do globally to foster healing after the worst of torture and war? As a dance movement therapist, I look to the human body for answers, especially the body moving. I've seen how dance therapy can foster resilience, how healing dance helps empower people to bring renewal even to the most decimated of communities. In 2006, I worked in a small West African town with a group of a dozen Sierra Leonean teenagers, all of whom as boys had been involved in atrocities with the revolutionary United Front rebels. Sierra Leone was perhaps the world's least developed country at the end of the millennium and was known for the vast number of children, many as young as six, serving as soldiers in a civil war that lasted 11 years. The dozen male teenagers in this group shared stories familiar throughout much of the country. Most had been brought up in small villages that rebel forces had attacked by night. Typically, the boys were age five to nine when they witnessed invaders slaughter their parents in front of them. Displayed in a hint of sorrow, the boys knew and the rebels would kill them too. What's more, at the very moment of experiencing this intolerable terror, the boys were forcibly conscripted into the rebel ranks, forbidden to cry or to enact the prescribed rituals for the dead, which for them was worse. They had to attach themselves to the very forces that had just obliterated their primary attachments and source of nurture. Children at war learn to suppress much of what it means to be human. They have to in order to survive the horror of what they witness and the guilt over their own actions. They basically split themselves apart, separating their minds from their bodies in a process we call dissociation. In order to engage in warfare, they cast aside moral reasoning, the traditional teachings of their culture, and enact their part in violence quite mechanically. At war's end, many child soldiers have a terrible time readjusting, reintegrating mind and body. It's equally di difficult to reconcile with communities that may want to have little to do with them, given their reputation for ruthlessness. Aiming to foster recovery despite such barriers, I encourage the youth to move in our group with vigor and purpose, dancing fully helped them organize their bodily experience and understand, not merely relive, post-traumatic sensations associated with the terror they'd endured. Dancing essentially reprogrammed the former boy soldiers' traumatized nervous systems and helped these youths to mend that mind-body split. The war had been over for four years when this child combatants group began. All of its members were orphaned, living on the street. They felt shunned by the terrorized community around them and had no access to organized social support. From day one, though, these former child soldiers demonstrated willingness to join with me and my three local co-facilitators in vibrant dancing, usually performed to recordings of the latest Sierra Leonean hip hop, their choice. The 12 initially displayed little feeling even when describing the most horrific of acts and regardless of whether they had been targets or perpetrators of the atrocities in question. They exhibited great difficulty even recognizing their feelings about their experience and seemed distinctly unable to express concern for anyone. Often enraged, some would voice lingering desires to launch violent assaults once again. Creative expression, though, proved instrumental in diffusing such violent impulses. Although their bodies held haunting memories that their minds still lacked the power to confront, these ex-fighters found in dancing together a culturally acceptable release of long-held muscular and psychic tensions. Each session, we would begin what dance therapists term a chasian circle, and we all called our weekly circle dance, an improvisatory activity lacking defined rules or fixed steps. 
with everyone facing one another in a circular formation. One facilitator would lead a physical warm-up to the rhythmic beat of Creo dance music. In punching the air one moment, then bouncing or swaying the next, all joined as one in the movement, and usually with an enthusiasm born of a deliberately shared focus. Experimenting together with the limits of their own aggressiveness helped these former fighters gain self-awareness and control. Consider one repeating action that emerged in these circle dances totally baffling me. Week after week, at some point in their improvising, the youths would capture one of my limbs and hold it down immobilized on the floor. Now, I was taller and much heavier than any of them, but I genuinely could not move. There was no apparent viciousness in this. It was rather playful, but it definitely called for interpretation. What was going on? Excavating answers to this question points to the depth of this form of collective expression. First, the ex-fighters, though probably without knowing it, were symbolically reenacting the capture of an enemy. Maybe they sought revenge for my role in prompting re-examination of painful wartime events. My authority also likely shared something with that of the rebel commandos who'd virtually enslaved them. Detaining me, the ex-combatants were killing off their leader quite possibly stopping me as the only white guy in the room, stood in for an otherwise unrealized dream of beating back the British invaders, the one-time colonial subjugators who'd returned a few years before to defeat the rebel army. Each of them had joined, whether willingly or not. And when they pinned my arms under theirs, it looked like a pile of hands spilled across the floor. An image visually reminiscent of the heaps of limbs they'd have seen when their assaults on villagers included amputations. In Sierra Leone's war, a common atrocity that some of them had been involved in directly and likely all had witnessed. I view this aggressive but not violent play as the former fighters unconscious means of gradually coming to tolerate their own horrific memories. A truly vital step. At the same time, in holding me down, it's almost certain that they were also symbolically responding to the fear of abandonment by a caring adult, which each of them had experienced in their lives in a most horrific way. Magically fixing me in place meant that unlike their parents or grandparents, I wouldn't die or disappear or desert them. Paradoxically, their freedom to act out such deep-seated fears emerged due to growing trust and restored sense of safety in the group. But at the same time, in pinning me down, these youths were doing their best to make us feel uneasy. The teens in asserting power were plainly testing the limits of our tolerance and acceptance of them, as if trying to force us to give up on them, something we simply refused to do. The unconscious symbolism of this repetitive dance play through which the former fighters made peace with their frightening memories gave way in time to deliberate embodiments. New dance therapy exercises helped these youths to apply conscious choice in portraying their experience, to symbolize at will through dance or gesture their own suffering and that of those who'd suffered under them. In this way, they depicted and owned their dual identities as both target and perpetrator of violence, and soon would share this insight in a well-attended public performance they chose to create, navigating paradoxical needs for acceptance and accountability, literally on the public stage. They acknowledged to a community that had long shunned them the roles they'd played during the war. 
And in response, they found themselves embraced fully as the community's children once again. This homecoming was a stunning triumph, but it was not the end. These former child soldiers claimed an International Human Rights Award, the 2009 Freedom to Create Youth Prize, which honored their exceptional courage in using the transformative power of art to reconcile with the community they'd violated so terribly. As one to witness every moment, I can attest that their redemption was authentic. And let me share a little secret. Without the dancing, it never would have happened.